Welcome back in to First Draft. We are exactly 10 weeks away from the start of the 2024 NFL Draft, but who's counting other than us? I'm Field Yates, and he needs no introduction. Mel Kuyper Jr. Mel, good morning, my friend. Great to be with you, Field. we got a lot to go over with this trade possibility with the number one pick overall. Then we have mm. the ratings board coming out tomorrow, so we'll have some guys that are the toughest to really figure out where they belong on our ratings board, even on our positional rankings for that matter. It's going to be a big spirited show because yes, we are going to dive into some offers that were part of a piece that I worked with Courtney Cronin, our great Bears NFL Nation reporter on, that dove into ideas, concepts, possibilities for the Bears to consider both in terms of offers for the number one pick and also offers for Justin Fields. And then as Mel mentioned, we'll go into five or so players that despite the fact that they might end up being first round picks or might be top 25 players on our big board, maybe a little bit outside of that, are really tough players to rank. A reminder, this is much more of an art than it is a science. For those that are watching this on YouTube, thank you. Be sure to check us out on the podcast version as well. First draft every Monday, every Thursday, Monday live on YouTube at 11 a.m. Eastern time and 2 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN2 for those that want to watch us up on the big screen. But Mel, let's dive into it. Justin Fields, the number one pick, the number one pick, Justin Fields. It has been perhaps the most bandied about storyline throughout the entire pre-draft process so far. So before I start to uh, pass along my hypothetical trade offers, Mel, let's dive into this Bears decision. Do you think this is a decision that is easy and straightforward, or do you think this is one where 48% of the Bears stakeholders within the office and the personnel department are pulling Ryan Poles one way and 52% of them are pulling him the other way? incredibly complicated probably one of the more difficult decisions the field and we always say this in the history of the draft right mm. uh yeah you always try to do that and embellish it a little bit but it's really not an overstatement no an overreaction to this and and really it's not uh trying to you know push this into a stratosphere it shouldn't be in this is a tremendously tough decision for a couple of reasons when you guys were talking you and courtney about this trade right you didn't give the bears much in return for justin fields i didn't see much coming the bears way yeah okay i see a lot coming their way for caleb Maybe even more than you think, right? Sometimes you over, you give up a little bit more. You go a little crazy because that's the guy you deem the next Patrick Mahomes. So you get a lot more for the number one pick, which represents Caleb Williams, okay, than you would by trading Justin Fields. Then you say, okay, you know, so that's right there complicates matters immediately. Because if you mm -hmm. say it's a push, well, it's really not a push yeah. because Justin Fields isn't bringing you back much. And then you have to decide soon, about what you're going to be paying Justin Fields. Is he going to be elite? Is he just going to be good? Caleb, you have time to figure that out. And maybe he could be a grand slam. So there's all kinds of arguments both ways. I've said all along, Field, and I don't know if you agree. If you can't make this decision, if you're sitting there and we're going back and forth in our war room saying, you think we should trade Fields. You think we should keep him. But you're not really strong on either case. You just have to, at that point, draft Caleb Williams. Mm. If it's there was no strong convictions in that room, and everybody's kind of waffling a little bit, and you can't get a consensus built, you have to take Caleb Williams. Uh, as long as somebody in there, the, the decision may say, hey, we don't like him for whatever reason. We don't feel strongly about Caleb. We're not buying into the Patrick Mahomes comps. We think there's a quarterback maybe as good or better. We think Justin Fields we would rather roll with Justin. It just depends on how they feel. But if they can't make that call and they just don't know what they're going to do with Justin, if he's the guy or is not the guy, you got to take Caleb Williams. If you like him and you believe strongly in him, you better believe equally as strong in Justin. So there's got to be a to figure it out moment in that room field at some point. Yeah, Mel, if this was easy, it may have already happened or there might be more traction on it or the Bears might have been a little more transparent about which way they were leaning at this point. But Ryan Pulse, to his credit, has done a very good job of keeping things close to the vest. Other reasons why I think it's complicated, Mel, and this is not straightforward, is that Justin has done enough to convince you that there could be greatness in there. The problem is it hasn't been consistently enough, right? You see these moments of brilliance from Justin that make you think this guy could be close to the player he was at Ohio State. And then you have moments that kind of leave you feeling cold, right? Plays where he holds on to the football too long or doesn't see the field as well as you would like a natural pocket passer to see it. So there's been some good and there's been some bad. But for a franchise whose quarterback history is not the worst that we have ever seen in the NFL, Mill, but when was the last 
great, sustained Chicago Bears quarterback. It has been a long time since we had a player at that position for this franchise. So it's tantalizing because of the history, not just because of the player. To me, there is no obvious, easy outcome, but I do lean towards trading Justin Fields, recouping whatever draft capital you can get, Mel, and then using that number one pick on Caleb Williams. And I'll lean into this dynamic, and we'll talk about it more as we sort of evaluate these offers. The timing of when a potential Justin Fields deal gets done is very, very important because right now there are a lot of teams that feel like they need a quarterback, and there's not that many great options available, be it in free agency or beyond the first three quarterbacks in this year's class. But a couple of things could spin the wheel during the first week of free agency, trades, players, changing teams. And all of a sudden, a couple of teams that might be Justin Fields suitor smell all of a sudden are off the table. And the leverage the Bears and the teams competing for Justin Fields have changes. So there's a lot of factors to dive into. So I figure let's do this, Mel. Let's begin and we can kind of go back and forth um, in, 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 in evaluating these offers. But I want to present each offer that I wrote for Courtney for her to evaluate to you. And we can talk through it. Let's do the number one pick offers first. These are picks, uh, offers made for the number one pick in the 2024 NFL draft. And Mel, after I submitted them, my general feeling was that I went way too light on these offers. That may sound jarring to fans when they hear what I offered, but my belief is that the tax could be even more significant than what I presented to Courtney. But here goes. Mm -hmm. To move up from pick number two, the Washington Commanders to pick number one, the Commanders would send pick two, the 40th overall pick in this year's draft, which incidentally was Chicago's pick that was traded in the Montez Sweat trade, and a first round pick in 2025. The only way that Washington would do this, Mel, is that they would have just one quarterback that they like, and that would be their primary target. We think it will be Caleb Williams. What do you say about this three for one swap? To move up one pick. Well, you figure it's you're you're going up to get Caleb, who's a local product. If you're Washington, you have the NBA influence there, so maybe you can get more than people think. Field for that pick from Washington, uh, in terms of going down to that second spot, and then you say, okay, could you move again to somebody like Drake or Jaden enough to say we got to go up and get that guy? Uh, so I think if you're at two, can you move again? You did it last year. Obviously, we'll get into you know how they feel about the number one pick, which would be yeah. Caleb. Obviously, if you're moving off of there, you're saying, okay, we have some concerns. We feel Justin's a guy we're going to roll forward with. Uh, you know, so we'll see how that goes. But I think in terms of the pick that you're talking about, you're getting in return. The second round pick, the Montez Sweat trade cost you that too. Montez Sweat's it was a heck of a trade. I, you let two teams in sacks. He's going to be a heck of a player moving forward. That's what you need. And it's like a finisher off the edge. They had that. Didn't work out with Claypool. Worked out with Sweat. So let's end that. That was a really good trade for Ryan Poles. The other trade was not. This one was made up for it. In terms of what you get in return, I think the bottom line here is, Field, you got to believe Justin Fields is the guy. Mm. And, and if you believe that, then and you feel he can be, and I don't have a problem with that. I had, I like Justin. You said what he did at Ohio. There were people who kept questioning him significantly, had significant questions coming out of Ohio State. Mm. And 10th didn't, overall, yeah. Didn't believe in him then and probably don't believe in him now. I'm not a QBR fan, so I don't really care about that. But they always throw that into the equation. But I saw what Justin Fields was doing on that football field this year, and I yeah. liked it. And I like the progress he made, love the way he competes. Is he perfect? No. Are there many that are? No, there are not. Mm -hmm. So again, Mahomes is in a separate category from everybody else in this league. Okay. There's a, there's a distance between Patrick and everybody else. He's special. He's one of the greatest of all time for a reason already. Yeah. He's still a young quarterback. So we can't compare that. We have to look at where we are with Justin. Can he be in that next grouping? Can he be in that Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson mix? That's what you have to decide here. Forget Patrick Mahomes. He's once in a lifetime. Yeah. Okay. Don't try, you don't try to get there. Patrick's going to be around. You're going to have other things going on to beat him. Tom Brady at the end of his career beat Patrick Mahomes, right? So let's worry about can Justin get to the Lamar Josh level? Mm. Let's decide that. Yeah. Do we feel internally he can be that kind of quarterback? If we feel he can be, and we know the players in that locker room believe in him, we know that. That's a game. Yeah. Players that put the Bears. Does that mean is that the end all be all? No, but all that that locker room believes in his quarterback. 
And it only puts more pressure, by the way, on the organization. If you do trade him, it better be a home run trade because the players will be saying, wait, 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 we were cool with Justin. We supported Justin. We thought Justin had a really bright future. If you trade him, you're going to have to deal with the potential wrath of the locker room and the initial blowback. But also, if it doesn't work out, Mel, the locker room will be very... Well, we're adding to that locker room with Marvin Harrison Jr., and that's what we're that's doing. Yeah. That's yeah. Just, what we're doing here by moving. If we draft Caleb, we don't get Marvin. We right. don't get Odunze. We don't probably get neighbors. We don't get any of the top three receivers at nine. Okay. More than likely, nine's not going to get you one of those guys. Yeah. So we have DJ Moore. We need another receiver. Now we got Justin getting the big timer, and we're getting next another first. All right. And we're getting a second round pick. So yeah. we're getting things going here by making that trade for Justin to get the help he needs. We draft Caleb, we don't get that receiver at nine. Right. So that's the discussion here. If you believe Justin Fields can get to that Lamar Josh level, if you believe that, mm. how old is, is Justin Fields? Well, is it his fourth year now? So like I mean, 25? Yeah. I mean, he's a young quarterback. Yep. Young quarterback. And their quarterback's coming into the draft as a rookie or 24 years of age. Yeah. So to me, if you believe that, then you trade, you, you don't trade Justin Fields, you trade the pick. Yeah. You trade the pick and get that monumental return, that bonanza of a trade, and help Justin Fields with better players around him. Yeah, this may not be like a total bonanza in the eyes of fans that are listening to this offer, Mel, but it certainly is, you know, it's something, right? It's an extra first round pick. You get that 40th overall pick coming back to you, and you're still in that catbird spot at number two. I think what's interesting about this deal and the next offer that I'll lump into it, Mel, because I think a lot of what we just said in regards to this Washington offer applies to the next offer, which is from the Patriots at pick number three. It will be the Patriots plus their second round pick, which is number 34. So even better than what Washington offered. And then their 2025 first, which it's so early, Mel, that it feels ridiculous to be forecasting how 2025 first round picks are going to look. But... I kind of think Washington is going to be better than the Patriots this upcoming season. So that 2025 pick might, in the eyes of Ryan Poles, be more valuable than the commander's 2025 pick. But you can do either of those trades and still be in the quarterback market, right? Like you could move from one to two because you say, while Washington is fixated on just one quarterback, maybe we evaluate Caleb and Drake May close enough or Caleb and Jaden Daniels close enough that – Hey, let them make the choice. Let them have the difficult choice at number one. We'll take the leftover of number two and still be able to trade Justin Fields. Would that be something that you would entertain at all? Two trades, one in which you move down from one and also eventually trade Justin Fields. Yeah, that all depends on how you evaluate the quarterbacks. You you nailed it. I mean, it's it's, it's how you feel about Drake May and and Jaden Daniels. Is there are they equal? Is one of those quarterbacks? You're not going to believe both of them are. Yeah, you're going to believe one of those two is right there with Caleb. I don't think they are. Myself, in terms of a rating, they're there on the board, but in terms of a rating, Caleb has that elite rating. Okay, Jaden got there this year where he's a high pick, but he's not that super elite. Drake would have been or maybe could have been, but he, I look at how he played. Yeah. And nobody's going to sit there and tell me they didn't see what we saw. I didn't see it on one throw or two throws. I saw multiple throws where, and, and games, multiple games where he wasn't playing like the second, third pick in the draft. So you're basing him on excusing away some of the things we saw, believing in the talent, the approach, and all that, that we can get him to that level. He didn't play at that level. If Drake May would have played at the level he did a couple of years ago or improved on 2022, he would have been in that discussion. But he didn't. Mm. And people say, well, Caleb didn't either. Oh, well, the first five games he did, and then he had some struggles. But he was, I would say, who was better in 2022? Drake May or Caleb Williams? Yeah, Caleb Williams. And Drake May was terrific, but it was Caleb Williams. Right. For by, sure. by, yeah. I wouldn't say a by margin. miles, but yeah. a significant margin there. Jaden mm. Daniels wasn't even in the discussion. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let let's throw. Let's go to 2022. I had a detractor of Caleb, who says they should keep Justin and trade that pick and not draft Caleb. Say, and I said, well, what did you see in 2022? Did you not like him there? Yeah. Oh no, he was sensational. He was spectacular. Mm. And I go always go back to my Bill Walsh conversation, a late great Bill Walsh, when he sat with me at that expansion draft for an hour, and said, 
No, when you see greatness, you see something special. If you see it on the field and it's not consistent, it's up to us as coaches to make it consistent. Mm. Once he shows that, Caleb showed it for a whole daggone year and ended his season through five games. We were saying Caleb's going to win the Heisman. He's clearly the best player in college football. Okay, yeah. so I don't, I don't know where if you if you said if you admit that it wasn't Caleb last year, 2022, bothering you with something he did wrong, or you saw something you didn't like when we all loved him, but you saw something that that, that shied you away from Caleb. If, if that's not the case, then it's up to your coaches to maintain that great level of sensational, mm. unbelievable, Mahomes like. Sure. Okay, I'm just giving it up on Mahomes, saying we're never going to get there. No quarterback. Well, we were saying maybe Caleb could. And now we're not because of a couple of games at the end of the year when things went awry for USC. I'm going to put it all to blame on a quarterback. I just think, hey, if Caleb would have finished out like he did 2022, we wouldn't be having this discussion. The only all reason right. we're having this discussion is because people, the Notre Dame game, a couple mm. games, the Cal game where he wasn't uh, completing a high percent. They're, they're going to a couple of games with Caleb and they're throwing away the sensational. That's yeah. what they're doing. Okay. And that's why this discussion is so fascinating because you can maybe, I would say, you can definitely argue each case. And I could give you a strong argument as you should, could do one and the other with that decide which case is the strong guess. Yep. They're both strong cases, but which one is the strongest case field? All right. So I want to plant my flag on this now. And I don't want to spoil the entirety of the podcast. We've got a lot of other offers to consider here, Mel. One more for that number one pick, and then three for Justin Fields, which have some similar tenets to them. But I would be on this track having evaluated these quarterbacks this year with the fundamental belief that Caleb Williams deserves a number one pick in this year's draft and a lot of subsequent drafts that have already taken place or a lot of prior drafts that have already taken place. Excuse me. My belief is that Caleb Williams is a worthy number one overall pick. He allows the Chicago Bears to reset the financial clock, which is a factor here, and that his upside is better than Justin Fields' upside. And I get it. We haven't seen it at all at the NFL level. But that's what the draft is. Every single year we are talking about players and projecting. I project Caleb Williams, based off what I have seen in two and a half seasons as a starter, to become a better NFL quarterback than Justin Fields. Thus, I would make the trade of Justin Fields, recoup whatever I could get, the best available offer out there, and put every subsequent resource into surrounding Caleb Williams with the pieces he needs to succeed. They've done a nice job in terms of finding two offensive tackles that can play. DJ Moore is a star receiver. They've got you know a bunch of guys in the backfield, no star, but they got a bunch of sort of a collection of backs here, Mel. It might come together sooner than people realize if they can find a way at pick nine to add one more offensive playmaker. So I am of the mind, trade Justin Fields, take Caleb Williams, number one. And I, I suppose if there is an offer that has literally never been seen before, you could persuade me otherwise, Mel, but I'm on team trade Justin Fields. That's the thing, Field, as you just said, what is the trade going to be? Is it going to be more? Because just because the chart says something yep. doesn't mean that Washington – says a Gonzaga quarterback and we're in the NFC right, and we have right. the NBA influence where there's five, not 22. Let's give it all up. If we, if Caleb is that Mahomes like quarterback, what do we care about an extra draft choice? Yeah. All right. Okay. We're, yeah. we're in a division here with the giants who have Daniel Jones, but they're still wondering about that. Right. We're in a division with Dak Prescott, really good mm -hmm. quarterback. And we're going to have Jalen Hurts, but the Very NFC good. isn't the yeah. AFC in terms of quarterback. So if we it get this, yeah. this Mahomes like quarterback, we're set. So yeah. we'll give up the ranch, okay, uh, to get this quarterback. If we have to over, you know, give up more than everybody says we should, so be it. So if you can entice Washington to do that, then it changes a little bit of the dynamic, but it doesn't change this field. Yeah. If you feel Caleb is a special quarterback. Yeah then it's hard. How can you pass them up? I mean, you, this is the most important position in any sport. You name the sport. The most important position is QB in the National Football League. And it's the hardest thing to find, Mel. So when there's one there for the taking, in the same way that every other quarterback comes with risk, Caleb Williams does. But when there is one sitting there for the taking at number one, there's no further effort required. You write his name down. You submit the pick. Roger Goodell makes the announcement on April 25th at about – 8.15 Eastern time. To me, that's the way to go. You mentioned these ideas of potential massive draft, uh, potential massive offers that involve tons of draft equity. I don't think this is, you said, if you get the ranch, this might not be one of those 50,000 acre ranches that you see on Yellowstone, Mel, 
But this might be like a nice cozy ranch in like upstate New York, beautiful landscape, got a lot of amenities to it. You know, it's got, I mean, who knows, thousands of cattle, maybe not hundreds of thousands of cattle, but you get what I'm pointing to. Mm -hmm. How about this offer? The third one that I came up. And this one here might make Falcons fans either very excited or kind of maybe quiver a little bit. The eighth pick in this year's draft, a first round pick next year, second round pick next year, a first round pick in 2026, and a second round pick in 2026. So three ones, two twos for pick number one overall. That's a big price right there, Mel. If you're Ryan Poles, are you saying, take it? I'm, I'm going with Justin Fields going forward. A lot of New York Atlanta gets the the local product. Uh, they get the kid who was from the Georgia. They get Justin Fields in a division. As I said, this Atlanta division with New Orleans iffy. You think about Carolina iffy, right? You know, yeah. Where are we right now with Tampa Bay and Baker? Baker probably back, but Baker's not spectacular, right? So you know, if you do get that quarterback that is spectacular, like you think Justin Fields can be. I mean, we still think Justin can be really, really good. Yeah. I'm talking about him. Can he be in the Josh Allen Lamar? Jackson category. Now, some say, no, that's too lofty an expectation, but can he be good? I thought he was pretty good this year. I he mean, he, he, no, he was. Justin Fields has, has definitely got a, a unique skill set. He's one of, he's the second most dynamic runner in the league right now amongst all quarterbacks. And on the short list, that may sound like I'm exaggerating, but on the short list for the best ever running quarterbacks, right? I mean, there's what three total that have had a 1,000 yard rushing season. He's one of those three. Mel, it's just the consistency, right? I mean, it's yeah. like the clock often moves so slow as Justin is processing. It was the same at Ohio back. State field. It was the same at Ohio State. Yeah, yep. I, 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 I remember really, the Indiana game where he threw yeah. three picks. I remember I was doing back and forth with radio with the Darian Mel show, and you're running yeah. back. Another interception. Yeah. Another interception because he waited too long. Yeah, so it's okay. got to process like, faster. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the same problem at Ohio State is still there at times. Yep. And to me, that's where, but if you're Atlanta, I'm a big in the divisions. I say it all. The divisions dictate everything. Totally. Yep. You got to have the best quarterbacks in the division. You got to have one of the best in that spot to be able to get to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And in that division, a Justin Fields in Atlanta, which they don't have a quarterback right now. Let's face it. They have nobody. No yep. All right. Yeah. So to me, if you can make that move, is it too much to give up? Yeah, it's too much to give up, but Justin Fields is just an average quarterback. Yeah, but if you okay. think he can be really good, you make that deal. Because right now, what is your option at Atlanta? Kirk Cousins? What, which, what are you going to do if you're Atlanta? If I yeah, said to you, that straight doesn't happen. What, who's Atlanta's quarter? Are they going to draft J.J. McCarthy at eight? All right, now Bo Nix at eight? They may not have a choice, Mel. That's right, yes. And, and their GM, Terry Fontenot, has not hid from this at all, right? Like, not at all. The tenor has changed, right? Like, last year, they were like, we, we think Desmond Ritter's got a shot. We think Desmond Ritter can be our long-term answer quarterback. Well, a year later, they're saying our number one priority this offseason, by far, is getting a quarterback. So they are not mincing the message whatsoever. By the way, this scenario, the Falcons trading for Justin Fields, the offer I made was for pick 43. So the other offer was the holy grail offer to go up to number one right. for Atlanta which we can circle back to here in a second. But as I said, Justin Fields has enough good skill sets. The 43rd pick in the draft now, that to me is a borderline, it's it, it's not a no-risk move, but relative to what it would cost to move up from 8 to 1, 8 to 2, or 8 to 3, the risk is so severely limited. Over the next two years, including the fifth-year option, Justin Fields will make in terms of the money he would make from the Falcons, under $30 million total dollars. Obviously, you want that money to be well spent. But even if it's not, $15 million bucks a year for a quarterback right now in the NFL, I know that sounds crazy. That's like a bottom third of the NFL quarterback at best, Mel. So I don't think it's a crazy amount for Atlanta to send in terms of the draft compensation or the total cash and cap allotments that they would be committing to Justin Fields to not make it worth that 43rd overall pick for all the factors that you just laid out. Would you consider the, the full Monty, though, the five picks for one for Atlanta to go up from eight to one and take your pick of Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels and Drake May, that feels like a pretty steep price to pay. Yeah, it is. And I think that's, again, where it just gets down to, and we're still early now. People say, well, where are we? Mm -hmm. Teams usually know who their quarterback is prior to pro days. Yep. Prior to pro days, field. Yep. I, I think pro days are a joke. I really do. They're so ridiculous, man. I mean, they so may, ridiculous. I, I know for a fact, for a fact, that yep. number one pick overall quarterbacks, the decision was made before any pro days. Mm. They go to the pro days because they don't want to tip their hand. Right. So they show up for all the quarterback pro days. Why? Because they have to. Yep. But they, in their mind, you already know. The see, last time I checked, they stopped playing college football a while ago. 
like so, three months ago for some yeah, of these guys. The season's been over for a while. Yeah. You can yeah. do a lot of so called due diligence since then to now and know what you have. Are you going to talk to them at the combine? Yeah, you're going to talk to everybody. But the bottom line is, I think they should already know. Mm. Is Caleb our guy or is Caleb not our guy? Yeah. Do we like Drake or Jaden enough? Or do we like another quarterback? Do you like J.J. McCarthy, Bo Nix, or Michael Penix Jr.? There's talk from people I speak to close to this situation that say that are in Chicago. They're going to maybe draft another quarterback. If they, if they don't take Caleb and they move forward with Justin, yeah, you make that trade, right? And still take another one. Yeah, that if they trade that logical one pick overall, and they move yeah. forward with Justin, they're still going to look at a quarterback. Well, okay, what is that telling you? Okay, mm-hmm. that's, you know, you want to say, okay, we want to kind of say let's put all our eggs in one basket here, okay, and have a chance that if we like another quarterback, to maybe get him. Who knows if that other quarterback could be unavailable when they're picking? Who knows that? But the bottom line here is the Caleb Williams evaluation, in my opinion, should be over. Certainly the Justin Fields evaluation is over. You've had him. You know him. Right. Okay. So you know enough about your guy. You know enough about that guy, Caleb, to be able to sit here right now and figure out within that room what our decision has to be. Now, if, they, if, if you say, Caleb, we're a little iffy and we loved you, then let's see if those offers, let's try to get a little bit more. Let's play the game. Ryan Poles has done a great job, as you said, not tipping his hand one way or the other. Yeah. Nobody knows. Now, could both of them be really good? Yeah. Justin Fields could be really good, maybe not great, but be really good. Caleb Williams could be really good, but not Mahomes like, but be really yeah. good. And we look back and say, hey, they're both pretty good going good. Sure. But if right now you that decision's made. I'm taking Caleb. You said you're taking Caleb because I can't figure it out. I don't really know if Justin's ever going to be that type of guy. Caleb has shown he can be, as the word was, or even a detractor that mm-hmm. says you got to keep Justin. Yep. Sensational in 2022. Yep. Unbelievable. Great. Well, I'm going to trust the Bill Walsh commentary and his philosophy on if you saw greatness, then you got to coach and maintain greatness. They call him coach for a reason. Coach in front of the name for a reason. Mel, that's what you taught me here. Um, I'm going to quickly address the offer from the Falcons going from eight to one. And this is my stance on it. It actually is not a player evaluation, Mel. It's an asset management evaluation, in my opinion. I think Caleb Williams is a worthy number one overall pick. If Atlanta trades up from eight to one and they don't take Caleb Williams, to me, they should have taken Caleb and they would have taken the wrong player at number one, despite my love for Drake May and Jaden Daniels. But there is a chance, as there is with every prospect that enters the NFL draft, that that player does not hit. And if you pay the price of a eighth overall pick, two extra first round picks, and two extra second round picks, and that player does not work out, Mel, that number one overall pick, your franchise has been set back for a decade. So maybe it's a 10% chance. Maybe it's a 20% chance. Maybe it's a 40% chance. Who knows? But we have seen this book at least one year into it with the Carolina Panthers, right? Who knows? Bryce could turn things around. He could look like an absolute star this season. That would be great for Carolina and the league at large, Mel. But you have to be careful because if things continue like they did in year one in Carolina, then we will look, look back at that deal last year as one of the worst in NFL history, it's about asset management. The risk incurred by paying everything to move up, to me, outweighs what you can gain unless you know the guy is Patrick Mahomes and nobody other than Patrick Mahomes is Mahomes himself. So um, I feel like it's too much. Let's focus in on deals that potentially could be made beyond the Atlanta deal for Justin Fields. Similar one here, Mel, the Steelers, who are eight spots behind the Falcons in round two, would trade pick 51 plus a fourth round pick. So two picks rather than just one, but a worse second round pick. If you were Ryan Poles, does this move the needle relative to 43? And maybe more importantly here, do you think that the Steelers should be acting as or more urgently than the Falcons to acquire Justin Fields? I think the Falcons should be the number one team for me because they have no quarterback. They're in a division where you can get that guy that can be the best in the division. I'm talking about Justin Fields. And to me, it's cheap. I mean, you're talking about Fields. A field's not, you know, you're not giving up a lot to get Justin Fields yeah. if you're Atlanta. The eighth pick overall is not in play here, okay? So you're not talking. You still have that eighth pick overall. Okay. So when you get Justin Fields, that to me is the best move. If I'm Atlanta, I understand the local. I don't care about local products. Not probably, He could be from Alaska. I don't care where you're from. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> he could be a California kid. It doesn't matter. He's Georgia, so be it. You know, yeah. like Justin said, there's a lot of pressure when you're a local guy too, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, that's how they feel about Justin. I'm Atlanta. 
that's the guy I target. To go up to one, I, it's it's too much. It's a lot. It, t- it costs. I love Caleb. And if you can do it, fine. But then, if let's like say if you're Chicago and Caleb's your guy, you're not trading that number one pick. The Justin Fields trade happens, and I'm Atlanta. I'm going to let him go somewhere else. For you're talking about Field. Give me the best. Give me the best offer somebody may give Chicago for Justin Fields. Give me. Give me even pay pay a little more. You have to pay a little more. What's paying a little more in a trade? for Justin Fields, going to cost you. All right, now here's the perfect scenario for the Chicago Bears right now. The perfect scenario, in my opinion. The first three teams in the draft are committed to taking a quarterback. So that puts off the board Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May. Again, you choose the order. Beyond that, Kirk Cousins stays in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Baker Mayfield stays in Tampa Bay. So that leaves teams like the Steelers, like the Raiders, Uh, Like the Falcons, that's three already right there who are saying to themselves, we need a quarterback upgrade. And the other thing that has to happen here, Mel, is while I don't believe these guys are the kind of players that I would want as my long-term solutions, quarterbacks like Jimmy Garoppolo, who we expect to be released by the Raiders, Gardner Minshew, who did an admirable job filling in for Anthony Richardson this past season, and by the way, has started multiple years and been pretty darn solid. You don't want either of those guys to be the answer in t- in, in cities like Denver uh, or Atlanta or Pittsburgh, right? Uh, you don't or, or the Raiders, and obviously Jimmy G would not be the answer in Las Vegas. But what I'm saying is, you don't want those those teams to say, "All right, well, you know, we could trade for Justin, but you know, we just do a one year deal with 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 Gardner Minshew instead. We'll give him one year and, and and ten million bucks, and we'll be good there, right? If that happens, if those guys either end up as backups somewhere else. Then you have potentially four suitors, four Mel, four Justin Fields as the most obvious target amongst non-draft prospects. And while you and I know the tale is told this time is that quarterbacks are going to go earlier than they should in the draft, Mel, if teams say the track record is not great, the track record is not good when you force quarterbacks up the board. History has shown us that generally when you force a quarterback up the board, it ends up being an invaluable, an asset that you wish you could have done differently. So Those teams buy into that mindset and say, all right, let's talk Turkey again with Chicago. And it's that second round pick plus more, Mel. I don't think a one is on the table for any of those teams because between Denver, Las Vegas, Atlanta, and Pittsburgh, the worst of those first round picks is 20th. And I think that's too rich, Mel. And I certainly wouldn't pay the eighth overall pick if I were Atlanta. So I think it's whoever you are talking to, their second round pick plus some more. That is is like the royal flush outcome for the Bears of the Justin Fields trade. Yeah, and then you get into the whole Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh. And as I say, (laughs) how do you feel about Kenny Pickett? It seems like they... I think I know the answer. You drafted him, you know, you you develop him, you have the injury, but he's shown flashes. He's shown he can be a... Maybe if he's Kirk Cousins Um, and you're Pittsburgh, are you happy, Field? If he develops into a Kirk Cousins type of quarterback, Kenny Pickett, I would be thrilled. I would do... I I can't do a backflip, but I would do several backflips somehow. I'd find a way. Yeah. So, so for Kenny Pickett, that's what you're gam- If you're saying you're the Steelers and you're Mike Tomlin, that's what you're hoping he can be. Yep. And I've said before, this division, are you kidding me? Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson in the AFC, Kirk Cousins type with Kenny Pickett. And I'm saying best case scenario. That's what I see is the best case scenario for him. Uh, if they feel like then they say, hey, let's give him and see what he can do. Uh, is, can Justin Fields be better than that? Yeah. He could possibly be because you yeah. talk about him as a great dual threat runner, right? Yeah. Is his passing going to get to that point when you help him a little more with another receiver to help out DJ more? Can that keeps developing? All these things come together. So again, I don't remember a field. I've been doing this for 46 years. And I remember back in 83 when the Baltimore Colts drafted John Elway and basically gave him away to the Denver Broncos. You're talking about number yeah. one pick. Remember that number one pick? John Elway, one of the greatest of all time, yeah. goes to the Denver Broncos for Chris Hinton, because it was a, that was the first round pick the year John went number one. He yeah. went early, like fourth pick to, to Denver. So Chris Hinton, an offensive lineman from Northwestern, yeah. the number one pick the next year, which became Ron Salt, a guard from Maryland, a guard yeah. from Maryland, and Mark Herman, a backup at best quarterback. That's all. Uh, that's all the Colts got for John Elway. Think about that. That's asset mis- mismanagement right, right there. That was a yeah. 19. That was a giveaway. That was yep. a giveaway. That was a Christmas present to the Denver Broncos. And how'd that work out? multiple soup, five Super Bowls and two Super Bowl victories for John Elway. And it, what did it get because of John Elway trade? The Baltimore Colts leave Baltimore, right? Yeah. And that led to that because look what happened. So the bottom line is when you think about where we are right now, 
the fascination and the intrigue of a number one pick overall, I haven't ever seen it to be to this where it's that difficult because you have a quarterback that's shown and you have a quarterback that has drawn comparisons to Patrick Mahomes and you're a team that is on the cusp of really being good. They're kind of with the bear, the lions where the bears are right now, but the lions were a few years ago. You can make that argument, right? So this is, you know, this is unbelievably intriguing for me. I, I haven't seen it in 46 years. I go back to when the, the Elway, I was here when you knew this guy was special, but you had other factors involved. But And the other factor involved here is Justin Fields, which complicates it and makes it a very difficult decision for the Chicago Bears. All right, last offer, and I'll just make it, I'll, I'll spell it out for people. We don't need to hash it out too much. It's by far the least likely, in my opinion. It's the Raiders who would offer their 2024 third Plus wide receiver Hunter Renfro on a massively reduced contract. Uh, Probably a non-starter. I I tell this to people who ask me about the Raiders all the time. Uh, Their offensive coordinator, Luke Getze, of course, the Bears' former offensive coordinator, has very strong opinions about Justin one way or the other, right? There's no way he's in the middle on Justin. He either thinks Justin is the second coming of Patrick Mahomes, or he thinks that Justin Fields is not the kind of starter you can win with. So um, I'll mention it. I think it's extremely unlikely, but uh, the Raiders absolutely need a quarterback upgrade somehow, some way this offseason. Let's pivot to our next topic here, Mel, which is interesting in so many ways. Uh, You would think that the guys at the top of the board should be easy players to rank, right? They're the best ones, but sometimes that's not the case. So let's dive into some prospects. And I have not heard your list at all. This is your list. I am just simply reacting off of it. Grab my list right here. I know. Yeah. Say that. Does that mean it's a lengthy one? Let's dive through a handful of players that you find to be extremely difficult to evaluate this season. And we'll dive into why. I'll start out with wide receiver Keon Coleman. Yeah. Florida State. Because we want to see, there were some quiet games. There was a couple drops on catchable balls. He had Jordan Travis, who was a Heisman candidate until he got hurt, right? He had Johnny Wilson on the other side. He had Trey Benson running the football. He had the yeah, Bell being the all-around guy. There was a lot of weapons in that offense for Jordan Travis. He was a key guy, and he's got basketball background. You think about it, to be able to high point the ball, win contested situations, be the red zone guy. I had him really high when it started. And what happened that first game? Boom, he pops. Wow, Keon Coleman. But there were some games where at the collegiate level, you should be taking over those games, and he really didn't. Some games where he wasn't as productive, wasn't, I say, a little quiet. Then the couple drops. So for me, how fast is he? What's his 40 time going to be? That's one of those guys at the combine we're going to wait and see. And that's going to determine. We talk about speed and testing out with those measurables. Keon Coleman is either going to be coming out of that combine saying, wow, put him in the middle of the first round, or let's put him in the second round. He has a lot riding on that. Combine pro day for Keon. Because I would say Keon Coleman for that reason. Field, Latu Latu. Okay. Because I don't know how the medical is going to be. I don't know how the team is going to feel about a neck. He played. He played great. He's a natural pass rusher, which everybody wants. How high do you put him? Jalen Phillips went 18. I have a little higher than that. Is that too high? Me too, man. That's the tough one for me. So I'll start outfield. Just I don't want to go all five or six, but yeah, I'll start with yeah. those two. Keon Coleman on the offensive side, wide receiver, Florida State, and lot two outside linebacker, pass rusher from UCLA on the defensive side. All right. So to address Coleman Mel, people just need to understand while he's awesome, he is that power forward in the red zone. Size, great, speed. Who knows? As you said, like next week is massively influential for Keon Goldman. If he runs in the four fours, Mel, game on, right? That might t- change the way that people view him. They might say, all right, this guy is a first round pick because the catch radius, the red zone stuff is so good. He was a punt returner earlier in his college career. Like that shows vision. It shows ball handling. It shows change of direction. A lot of things that are very important. But if he runs something in like the low four sixes, Mel, how many wide receivers are cracking the first round with that kind of 40 time? Latu, Latu, I've decided on something, Mel. I'm waving the white flag medically because I have no idea. I'm not a doctor, never uh, claimed to be one. I have no idea, but as I thought about it, and I updated this in my most recent top 25 okay. uh, that was updated last night. It should be on the site uh, by Friday of this week. I have as my highest ranked defensive player. And it's not like he was low on my board prior to this. He was just below Dallas Turner. But every time I go back and watch him, I think to myself, what can't this guy do? Isn't this a league in which we would do anything 
to acquire a pass rusher. The second highest paid position in all professional football right now is pass rusher. The guys at the top of the heap, the TJ Watts of the world, the Miles Garrett, the Nick Boses, et cetera, et cetera. They're making the second most amount of money only behind the quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Real Latu is a ready-made pass rusher. I get it. The athleticism is not going to be as elite as Dallas Turner. But there is an art to pass rushing as well. He's mastered it already. I mean, the stuff that he did this past season when teams were constantly giving him a ton of attention led to a guy like you know the Murphy Twins, who are also draft prospects here, had good seasons this year. Not because they aren't good players, Mel, but also aided by the fact that those guys are being blocked by like running backs and tight ends left and right. Leatu Latu is the best defensive player in the draft. And I can't call the medical one way or the other, Mel, but I've decided that until someone tells me it is absolutely going to impact his draft status, I'm leaving the top of my defensive board and not thinking twice about it. Yep. I can't argue with you on that one. I, all things being equal, he's the best defensive player in this draft. Yeah. yeah. So we'll find out next week. So we're two for two on guys that have big combine weeks ahead of them. Who else is difficult for you? I'm going to go right to a multitude of players, a defensive tackle. I was trying to rank because I'm mine's going to be up Friday as well. My new top 10 is the new top 25 up Friday, tomorrow. On ESPN.com along with yours, Field. I'm anxious to see how, where we differ, where we agree. Yep. Defensive tackle position was supposed to be great. It turned out to be very average. It kind of recovered a bit. And it's going to recover if a couple things happen. Yep. And I can't figure out Johnny Newton at Illinois. Yep. Loved him in some games. Thought he could be moved into other games. I thought he was a little, I wouldn't say one dimensional, but I think he's got some versatility and three technique, all that. How does he fit in scheme wise? It's going to be up to the D line and the system you have in place. Yep. And I get to a, the two Texas kids. Yeah, here we go. This is the big problem I have. Yep. I know what Tavondre Sweat is. Yep. He's a mammoth. You're not running up the gut against us. And we're going to, I'm going to free up my linebackers to flow the football type. Sam Adams type defensive, Haloti Nada, that type of guy, the late great Tony Saragusa, right? He's that kind of guy. Remember when Ray Lewis was making all those plays? Oh, man. You had Goose and you had Adams. Then yep. he said, well, we got to get Nada once they were, but now we got to get Nada. We got to free Ray Lewis up, right? That's what you need. That's Tavondre Sweat. Byron Murphy the second. He is one of those guys you get, you dream about as to what he could be in terms of disruptive. We can coach him. We can develop him. He's got the explosiveness and the quickness. He has more upside in terms of being disruptive and getting sacks, right? Than Tavondre Sweat does. Okay. Tavondre Sweat, if we were in the 90s, it'd be a top 15 pick. Yep. Okay? Oh, yeah. Iron Murphy, the second, fit, fits what guys want, what defensive line coaches want, what you need in this league. But was he dominant? No. There were games at Texas where I was underwhelmed. So I'm sitting there with Byron Murphy the second saying, wow, I see what everybody's saying. I'm dreaming about what he can be. I'm I'm sitting there thinking, oh, now I see Byron Murphy the second. I can see what he can be, but I haven't seen it yet at Texas in the collegiate ranks where there's AOGs. I'll say it for the first time this year, another occupation, guys, the AOG. Okay. The NFL, the best in the business. So there, then you get to another guy, Mason Smith from LSU. Hmm. I love the potential. They raved about him dominating fall practice. Brian Kelly did. He gets hurt the first game. This year he's banged up, but then he's playing well late in the Wisconsin game. Mason Smith, Michael Hall Jr. at Ohio State, undersized, but he's quick and he pops. And he can, on the Notre Dame game, are you kidding me? But then he can get rooted out yeah. because he's undersized. So he's kind of a little one-dimensional there, right? I, you know, I'm all, you know, I look at the defense, Leonard Taylor the third. Oh, man. Based on 2022, he's going to be a first rounder guaranteed. He, where's the production? So, None. the defensive tackle spot to me has a host of tough guys to evaluate, a number of tough guys to evaluate. So, I'll cover, I covered a lot of them field. They're all tough. Yeah, I'll pick a few from there that stand out to me. Let's we'll start with Devondre Sweat, the biggest man of that entire group, by the way, the biggest player, probably. And he's up there for biggest player in the entire draft. 362 pounds was what his listed weight was down uh, at the University of Texas. He did not weigh in at the at the senior bowl now. And that to me is sort of one part of this story is that if you're looking for a player who, if you went to YouTube and just looked up the Devondre Sweat highlights, it'd be the best highlight tape of any defensive player in all of college football, right? Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, during the senior bowl week, there were reps. There's a rep against Bo Limmer that has continued to make the rounds. Bo is a, a you know, probably a what, fourth round pick or something like that uh, from Arkansas center guard prospect who had a good career for the Razorbacks. And by the way, Bo Limmer, one of the strongest players in the entire Arkansas program this past year. I'm talking weight room strength and functional strength too. 
Sweat just runs right over. I mean, he it just like he he looks like the wind, like blowing over a branch or something. It's unbelievable. He can do that to you in small doses. The question I have, Mel, is am I going to get a guy who's an A plus on some number of snaps and then a C minus on other snaps because of the fact that at his size, it is simply difficult to stay on the field for a huge number of snaps per game. Haloti Nadas are like rare birds now. Like you can't find guys at his size that are playing 65, 70% of the snaps. So even if Tavondre Sweat is playing 45, 50% of the snaps for a team, what efficacy are you getting on a snap in, snap out basis? Which is why when I'm evaluating those two Texas players, I take the player and Byron Murphy, who maybe he's more of an A minus than an A plus, but you're getting that much more consistently. That's been my big drawback on Devondre yeah. Sweat, which is keep why I have a hard time using a first round pick on him. Yeah, keep in mind they pick their spots. All the great ones even pick their spots. Yeah. You can't go 100 miles an hour in every snap in the NFL. You can't. When you're, when you're 300 plus pounds, you can't do it. Yeah. So, you know, you have to pick your spots, and they all do, all of them. Do, mm -hmm. but they pick it at the right time. I'll go to Chris Jones. He always shows up at the most critical the biggest moments, junction, no doubt. Right? Okay. Why do you go in the second round of the draft? Because he picked his spots, right? They, they picked their spot. You. That's why he, was, he wasn't a top ten. People think Chris Jones went in the top ten of the draft. He went in the second round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the only reason that he's a Chandler City Chief to reiterate is because they didn't get Paxton Lynch, yeah. who they wanted. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they traded back know. and got Chris Jones. The next year they got Patrick Mahomes. Amazing. We talked about yeah. that enough. But the bottom line is defensive tackles has always been difficult to evaluate for that reason they do have to because of their phys their physical stature pick when they are going full steam ahead when they see a play on the other side <laughs> i'm not going to give it on that i, I got to come back for the next snap and yeah. and and try to maybe get in there and wreak some havoc so they're not the the linebacker the safe that you see flying around every play and doing things and going 100 miles an hour so that's where you got to think put it all into perspective field and realize there are times where you're going to be wondering what but that's just the way they have to play the game yeah, he, but that to me is why he's a second round pick. A guy that if you took him at 42, I'd feel great about it. If you took him at 22, I'd be nervous about Tavondre Sweat and every single snap getting what you need to justify that level of investment. The only other one that I want to mention for right now, Mel, because we could do an entire defensive tackle rip, is Johnny Newton, who we love. I don't think anybody who watches Johnny Newton for a second does not love the player. Seven and a half sacks this past year, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. All the accolades were well deserved. The huge, huge question will be, disruptive as all get out against the pass, what's he going to be against the run? And I get it. We are in a passing league. But still, as you know, Mel, what do the great offenses do when there's a player who's vulnerable? They say, fine, we'll just chunk run you to death, right? Yeah. The Chiefs this year were a defensive team first. They were a passing team on offense to a degree, but they also have this dynamic running game now with Isaiah Pacheco, seventh round pick, of course, just a couple of years ago, where they see a vulnerable defensive lineman. They're going at, they're going to attack that player, snap in and snap out. That to me, in, in my evaluation and also just hearing from scouts, is probably why if Johnny ends up being more of a fringe first round pick as opposed to like a top 15 pick, which I might have thought coming into the year, that might be one of the big roots behind it. And we'll see on the arm length next week as well, because yeah. the arm length uh, in Indy will tell you part of the story. I'll give you one more guy, Field, for me. Yep. Cooper DeGene. Yeah. I, yeah. The Iowa corner. People say, well, he's a safety. He's not a corner. I love the player. And I think, of course, he was injured late in the year. Yep. I'm probably going to be end up being higher on Cooper DeGene than some because I love the fact that if he can't get it done here, he yep. can go there. So you got a security blanket wrapped up in Cooper DeGene. Okay. Mm. So for me, and he, when he's healthy, he would test off the charts. So off I, the I charts. think there's a kid, an Iowa defensive player. We saw Jack Campbell go mid first, and everybody was surprised, right? Lucas Van Ness, Riley Moss, the list goes on and on of these Iowa players, right? The Kirk Ferentz and that staff coach up. Phil Parker coaches up. And Cooper DeGene is a guy, NFL-ready player, heck of a player. I'm probably going to have him rated higher than a lot of people feel. I don't know. Uh, I see projections late. I, I think NFL teams are going to be, I would say, all over the map. But I, I'm anxious to see where Cooper DeGene comes off the board come late April because he's a tough guy to, to mock. He's a difficult guy to rate. Uh, when you stack them up against the true cover corners that you know are locked into that spot, whether it's, you know, you know, Wiggins at Clemson, whether it's Arnold at Alabama, you know, whether it's Mitchell at Toledo, whoever it may be, Rake Straw at Missouri, whoever you're yep. talking about that, where does Cooper DeGene, uh, safety, he's the best safety in the draft. Want to project him to safety? He's better than Newbin at Minnesota or Kenshin's at Miami. He's, yep. a, he's the best safety. You can put him there and say, that's where he'll be. I think he can play corner. I'm yeah. not giving up on, on DeGene being a really good corner. So I have him right there pretty highly rated because I love the security blanket that that option becomes. 
I'm playing him at corner, and I know that the functionality is there for him to be. The versatility is him for there uh, there for him to be a safety. My game plan, if I draft him, is let's keep it at corner because he was terrific there, Mel. Like he is such an impact player at corner who can do a lot of other things. Uh, this is going to sound. I hope it doesn't come across as like uh, as like setting too low of a bar, even though I think this guy's a heck of a player. But as a corner, you can do some Mike Hilton type stuff. Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, and then eventually the Bengals, Mike Hilton, like the kind of guy who can impact the game as a blitzer. He can make plays in the running game as well, on top of being able to really cover. I think that the ceiling is much higher for Cooper DeGene. Um, I think more so than any other player at the top of their class at their respective positions. The cornerback room, Mel, the, the margin between one and five is like this. I think I have the highest rated of those five that you mentioned. Those are my top five. I believe the highest rated and my overall top 25 is 13 yeah. and the lowest rated is like 21. Yeah. So it's a quarterback run, right? It, it gets hard to figure them out. And to go to your Mike Hilton comp, I think Mikey Sanger still from Michigan is a Mike Hilton type of guy. There's a great one too. Yeah. Yes. I think that's the guy that's going to probably, because of Hilton, who went undrafted out of Ole Miss after having a career Crazy. where he just was a thorn in the side of an offense. He yeah. always showed up and he popped at critical moments. A Mikey Sanger still, a, a Jim Harbaugh. Fan. Don't be shocked if he's an LA Charger. Oh. <laughs> uh, third round pick, fourth, fourth round fifth pick, right? Round if you get a Mike yeah. Sanger still heading one day three to the Chargers because uh, yeah. Jim Harbaugh loved that kid. Yeah, love him. Uh, former wide receiver, a total star on special teams as well. So yeah, Cooper Jean, I hear you because it's hard to, like the hard part for me is just sussing out which player deserves to be cornerback one versus cornerback five. I don't think there's a Christian Gonzalez or a Devin Witherspoon in this year's class mail, but I think there are five guys who are all fantastic that all have a very comparable grade. Anybody else? Any last player that was difficult for you? To I saved the best for last. I think I know. In terms where you're of going. the most difficult player, in my opinion, to evaluate and put a grade on, and Offensive that tackle? is that is JJ McCarthy. Oh. <laughs> I am all over the place on JJ. Yes, I love Thank everything you about his makeup. Love the way I know he's going to test athletically because I love those kind of. I love what he did how he responded in that national title game when they were up against it momentum had swung you know they were getting back in it they, they had guys open Penix just never found his rhythm but the bottom line was they were challenged and when he used his legs at the most opportune moment he threw the ball when he had to delivered some perfect strikes that were not were not caught they were dropped one by Loveland one by Johnson Yep. I love the way he can. Hey, he didn't care about handing that ball off in the Penn State game. He's a team guy. Whatever it takes to win. Jerome Moore's calling run plays. Hey, I, we'll, we'll run it down your throat, right? We mm. got Blake Corum. We got this offensive line. We got Edwards. Hey, we're fine. We got we got seven, eight offensive linemen. We, hey, play to our strength, right? Not saying I'm a weakness. It's just, hey, if we can win a game. How, the last time I checked is winning the game. It's not worry about the margin and winning the game. So for, for, for a, a team guy, Tough guy, super competitive, athletic as all heck. He's going to test out really athletic at the Combine Pro Day. Does he have a howitzer? No, but can he make every throw? Yes. But he didn't have to carry the team. Mm. And you never, and you, you wanted the wow moments. I thought I saw a couple in the national title game, but it wasn't something you saw over a four quarter period. He jumped out as, as a franchise quarterback. To me, JJ, I'm at 23 on my big board, 23, 24 area field. I don't think I can move him any higher. Yeah. Can he go higher? Possibly. Yes, he will. First, I'll ask you, where's he on your on your board? How do you feel about JJ? He to me is the most because he's a quarterback, and that's the most important position in all sports. He's the toughest player to put a ranking on. Let me make sure that I didn't, as I adjusted these last night. So I want to make sure that I have this correctly before I say something inaccurately about where JJ ended up. He ended up not ranked for me in my top twenty-five okay. here, Mel. Uh, and I thought about it. He was he was twenty-five in my most recent edition. My uh, new player at player twenty-five is Darius Robinson from Missouri. Yeah. Who I feel great about him, right? I I love that. Guy. Chop Robinson became my twenty-five this week. Oh my god, Chop is going to be awesome at the combine next week. Uh, different conversation for a different yeah. day. Yeah. But I've talked to people at the highest levels of evaluation, general managers around the NFL, and they've all told me the same thing, Mel. Nobody knows on JJ McCarthy. Anybody who tells you they know exactly what he's going to be, Mel, is lying to you. You're right. The sample size is just so much smaller on him. I'm not saying that J.J. McCarthy is going to be a better player or a worse player than Bo Nix. I'll have him ranked a little bit higher, I think, by the time we get to the draft. But if you don't know what Bo Nix is, by the time we get to April 25th, 
it's because you haven't worked hard enough. The guy started more games than any other quarterback in FBS history. J.J. McCarthy is incredibly difficult to find out. On top of the fact that he's basically a full-time starter for two years, Mel, as you mentioned, didn't have to do that much relative to other players. I've used this stat before on the show, but I'll reiterate it. In his last six games of the season, which, you know, that was the meat of the schedule. You got Ohio State, Penn State, Iowa in the Big Ten Championship game, and then, of course, the two playoff games, Washington and Alabama. 847 passing yards. 847. That's like 145 a game, Mel. That's just different. That's, again, 145 yards, that's a that's a half of Michael Penix Jr., right? Let me ask you this, Field. Let me ask, yeah. where, where and who was his elite wide receivers? Uh, he didn't have a, well, I think Roman Wilson's a hell Roman of a player. good player. Yeah, really good, good player. player. But where was, yes. where was the Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunze? Where was the Malik Neighbors? Where was the Brian Thomas Jr.? Uh, didn't have that. Jaden had two of those guys, of right? Of course, yes. And so, again, yeah. where was, they didn't have that. Portland Loveman was that. the best was player in that offense. Centric offense, run-oriented offense, yeah. offensive line. Dom. He didn't, he didn't have that. You know, right. he really never had that elite wide receiver who he could say, I got a go-to guy that I got to feed that ball eight to 10 times a game to. I completely agree that the receiver talent, I mean, every other quarterback prospect that we've talked about has amazing wide receiver talent. That being said, I don't think it was bad players he was playing around. It's the best offensive line in college football. You know, it should to me, it should have won the Joe Moore Award for the third straight season this year. Great season for Washington. I thought Michigan's offensive line was even better. They've got, a, I think, a future, you know, top 50 pick, maybe a first round pick next year. Courtland Loveland, a tight end. You know, they're going to have like, uh, Roman Wilson's probably going to be a top, what, 75 pick at worst, right? Somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Cornelius Johnson could be a day three pick as well, right? I mean, not a star. I mean, AJ Barner, transfer from Indiana, maybe a day three pick as well, right? Um, but I, 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 I hear you on the argument that way, but I still have a hard time saying that like his his proficiency as a passer was on the same level of any of the guys that we have talked about. This is why it's complicated, Mel, is that like I can sit here and tell you some traits that I do like. And by the way, yeah. there's a really good chance he goes in the top 15 picks in the draft. Yeah. Really good chance. Yeah. Yeah. And the throws matter. When you don't throw the ball, you know, like a lot of these quarterbacks, college quarterbacks, they make a bad throw. You forget about it because the next five passes are, are coming out of his hand, right? You're not running there. Throw, 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 throw. And when you're doing that, the error, you don't notice, right? You notice an error when even a shortstop, he gets a ton of ground balls hit to him in the course of a game, right? He's gotten a lot of action. He's getting a lot of action. The, the one he booted in the first inning, right? Do you remember that when he made a great play going deep in a hole? He went, yeah, made, made things happen, did his job the rest of that game. J.J. had to be on, and you remember. I remember the Maryland game right before the half. Yeah. They got a chance to, to extend after Maryland got back in the game, get a touchdown on the board, right? Throws a pick in the end zone, right? Yeah. Didn't see the tender, bad read. He throws three picks against Bowling Green, the two pick sixes against TCU in the, in the semifinal game a couple of years ago. He, when he made an error, you remembered it because mm. he wasn't throwing a ball 50 times a game. Yeah. Okay. So he was back in the Troy Aikman days, 25 passes a game, right? Yeah. 15 yeah. for 25 was a pretty good day back in the day in the NFL. It was, okay? yeah. Now, it, that, and that's where J.J. was with Jim Harbaugh. It was kind of old school where the passes mattered and you remembered the error more than you would with a guy who throws it all over the yard. Yeah. Here's where I land. This is where I land on this. One thing I know for sure, Mel, the gap between quarterback three and quarterback four is large in my book. It's a gap. It's a it's a gulf, right? Whether you think it's Jaden Daniels as quarterback three, Caleb Williams as quarterback three, or Drake May as quarterback three, I feel terrific if I'm the Patriots and I take any of those guys quarterback three, third player overall. I feel great about my investment. If I take J.J. McCarthy eighth overall or 11th overall, the Vikings, 12th overall, the Broncos, 13th with the Raiders, 20th with the Steelers, makes me queasy. He yeah, could I'll be throw names out. Player. Remember Christian Ponder? Remember E.J. Manuel? That's remember, the guys talking Jake, about. Remember, remember Jake, Jake Locker? Locker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we go back in the history of the draft and say all these guys, like I say, were over drafted. Maybe Kenny back. Pickett. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 So again, you're talking about teams have to have them. Can you talk yourself into some of these guys? Sure, you can. I do it. Yeah. Yes. You can talk yourself into a lot of these guys, Field. You can do it. And uh, again, that's why it's going to be really interesting to see. You know, who, as you say, is QB4? Is it JJ? Is it Michael Penix Jr.? Is it Bo Nix? Yep. Uh, you know, it's, it's still a, a battle. But I do think athletically at the Combine, uh, and like I said, does Combine really matter? But I think it will show how, how athletically gifted JJ McCarthy is.
man, it really is a fascinating player to discuss. We could do an entire J.J. McCarthy segment, a show probably just on the quarterbacks. I'm sure we'll do that and so much more. But we are back here on Monday, another edition of First Draft coming around the corner. He is Mel Kuyper Jr. He is a legend. Enjoy your second football-free weekend, Mel, which actually means that you and I will be diving in. I got mock draft coming out Wednesday. I got work to do, pal. Baby. I got calls uh, to make, people to speak to, information to be had. Mock 2.0 for me will be out on Wednesday, the, I believe it's the 28th of 28th, February. that's right. Yeah, and I actually called my most difficult grading teacher back from elementary school, and I, I said, you know, what are the tricks of your trade here? Because i got to make sure that I come with a hammer on Wednesday for my grade, for Mel's Mock 2.0. Uh, we will talk to you all then. Mel, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you guys on Monday, the next first draft. Can't wait.